A very good evening to all of you. We've had an interesting session with the illusionist and we're going to move on uh, to someone who is doing something very extraordinary with toys and with the virtual world. I invite Paul and welcome him to Ahmedabad Design Week 2.0. Uh, Paul is a well-known American entrepreneur, artist, designer, filmmaker, photographer, author, and database programmer. He has founded over a dozen companies, including his current venture, Superplastic, the world's premier creator of animated synthetic celebrities, toys and apparel, art toy brand, Kidro Boat, luxury bicycle manufacturer, Budnitz, Bicycles and Elo, the social network for creators. Over a dozen of Budnitz, Designs appear in the permanent collection of uh, Museum of Modern Art and his films have won awards at film festivals around the globe. He wrote the backend software that runs most of his companies is the author of four books and lectures on creativity worldwide. He studied art at Yale University and currently splits his time between New York City and his home in Burlington, Vermont. We're extremely pleased to have you here uh, and uh, now the session is all yours, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very, very excited and honored to be here. And um, for those of you that came yesterday to see me, there seemed to be a schedule mix up, which was totally our fault. And so I want to apologize for that and say thanks for having me. I'm going to talk um, a bit about my career and the kind of weird stuff I've done and, and how, I, how I think and what I do. And then uh, hopefully, if I can move fast enough, we'll have some time for some questions afterwards. So I'm going to start out uh, by presenting my screen. Everybody scream really loud if for some reason um, this doesn't work. But I think we're probably seeing that. So yeah, so my, my current uh, company and venture and thing I'm working on is called Super Plastic. I'm actually going to get to that uh, more toward the end of this talk and show you what we're doing. And I'm going to start a little bit just talking about me and how I ended up doing so much weird stuff with my life. And I will go back to 1980, um, kind of ages me. So what I really wanted to do in life more than anything else is I wanted to be one of the Beastie Boys more than anything else. Um, but the problem was I had no talent in music. I had no talent in performing and I was constantly in bands and we were terrible. Um, but it turned out what I was good at was working on computers. Um, I'm 53, so when I started working on computers, I was uh, probably 11 or 12 years old. And this is what a computer looked like. Um, this is a teletype machine that they had at my junior high school in Berkeley, California. And um, it was on loan from the University of California. Um, and uh, I had a small business uh, buying illegal fireworks, uh, firecrackers and things like that from Chinatown uh, in San Francisco, bringing them back to school and then selling them to all my friends. And I was making a lot, a lot of money. Uh, and because of that, I decided that I would be really smart and computerize my sales list. This was my first business. So I put all my clients who were my um, friends basically on the computer system. But what I didn't know is the computer system was on loan from the United States Department of Defense that had loaned the computers to the university. And so when they saw all these explosives coming up on the computer, I was visited by the American FBI and I was arrested and I was kicked out of school for a week. And I was almost kicked out of school permanently, but I was so clever that they decided they'd let me stay. And I think, I feel like a lot of my career has been things like this, where I accidentally do things I wanna do um, and then get away with it in a kind of lucky way. So um, after that, I actually ended up programming software, safety software for nuclear power plants. I did that uh, before I got to college as a way to make money. And when I got to college, which is about 1990, I sort of swore, as when I got out of college, actually, I should say, uh, I swore I would never work on computers again, which didn't really happen. But I had grown an interest in fashion, art, design, and um, in filmmaking and I actually had threatened to drop out of Yale University because I was bored and they reassigned me into the art department and that seemed more appropriate I actually ended up really enjoying myself so um 
I, I, one of my first businesses, um, I started buying used Levi's in the United States. Um, we buy them by the pound and then we'd ship them over to Japan where we'd sell, we sold some single very old vintage pairs for 14 or $15,000. And it was, it was really my first, uh, one of my first um, moves into business and also into um, fashion at the same time. After that, um, I, I was also shooting movies for a living, partly I was losing money making movies. I was writing independent films, uh, both for in Europe and in Hollywood. I was making almost no money doing that, but um, for my own movies, we this was before iPods and digital recorders, we had hacked mini disc players so that we could use them to, um, to make, to shoot on the street without uh, permits actually, so we could make independent movies. And we discovered that some of the hacks we'd done on some of the mini discs were selling, so were sellable essentially. So we sold hack mini disc players and mini discs out of a garage in California in order to pay for making movies. And soon I had a $10 million business, which I eventually sold um, one of the early web businesses actually selling hacked electronics online. From there, I moved to New York City from California and I started hanging out with street artists. Um, one of the things I really love about street artists is that they usually aren't in the old days and they are a little bit now, but they weren't paid for their work at all. They just did their work out of passion. And that made them really an ideal and exciting group of artists to work with. And these were also my friends, people who were just going out to make art for the fun of it. And a new style was coming. This new art style was coming. Um, this is, for example, a uh, a graffiti that was done by a couple friends of mine. And this is the, this is a view from the Brooklyn bridge looking down and you can just imagine the size of this. These guys got up and did this all night in one night and then ran away. So they wouldn't be arrested basically. Um, I also became really obsessed with retail design. Uh, I, I started visiting stores and, and I became just really, really interested in how things are made beautiful and how they look valuable. Right. So if you go into a product store, you may see a pair of shoes that is eight hundred dollars. But it's fascinating to me how you can go into a store like this and you could take those same shoes and stick them in a market in Chinatown in New York City and sell them for ten dollars and nobody would know the difference. So it was really about display and packaging and so much money was put into retail packaging and and how things are displayed. And I always thought that was just such a great thing. So in 2002, I was hanging out with these graffiti artists and I. Oh, I started this company, Kid Robot. Um, Kid Robot was based uh, a bit on these toys that I saw in when I visited Hong Kong on one of my trips. There were these artists that were taking toys um, and customizing them. They would take a toy, that, like a GI Joe toy that they'd buy off the shelf, they'd cut the head off, they'd sew new clothing for it. And it was tied in with street art. So, so we started making our own toys, mostly working with these, my friends, who were not famous people at the time and who are now very famous people, some of them, um, but saying that they were already famous. So this was part of the marketing. <laughs> We'd work with artists, um, have them design toys and say um, they were already famous people and people decided that they would believe us and started collecting all their toys. And they were small runs and, and we still do this in my current company, runs of anywhere from 200 to 500 to 1000 pieces of a toy and when it's sold out, it's gone forever. And one of the aesthetics really um, that, that we were working with, it was just a personal aesthetic that had to do with, um, we call it a, a little darkness or a little scariness and a little cuteness mixed together. How it, we, they're really the, the toys were designed for adults, not for children. And I think I'm gonna use, I think, um, Gloomy Bear, which is a, a toy designed by Mori Chax, he's a Japanese artist, as an example of that aesthetic and why this really makes for an adult toy because gloom, the story of Gloomy Bears, it's a cute little pink bear. Um, its owner named, whose name is Pity finds Gloomy Bear in a box on the street, brings up Gloomy Bear, nurtures Gloomy Bear, turns Gloomy Bear into its best friend and a pet. And then eventually Gloomy Bear grows up and, and, and um, slashes his owner and kills him and bites his head off. And it's that sort of really twisted combination of incredibly cute pink bears and violence that was really interesting to us because, you know, as adults, you know, when we're children, we look at toys, often toys are just one thing. They might be just cute like this, right? But as adults, as we grow, as we grow older, we have mixed feelings. We have more complex feelings. Sometimes we love things, sometimes we hate things. And um, it's that combination of incompatible emotions, love and hate, beauty and 
ugliness that makes something feel adult and really goes into street art. These are some of the toys we made with Kid Robot. Some of these are about 10 to 15 years old. Some of them are now, I think, as, as Tarona mentioned, in, in museums around the world. Um, we created this form called Dunny. This is Dunny. And we got really famous other artists to, to, to work on them. This is Bicycle, street artist, um, now quite famous. Haki, who still works with me at my current company. Junko Mizuno, a Japanese artist. These are all toys we made. We used vinyl because it's a very inexpensive way to make toys. Vinyl molds are made out of copper. Um, they, they're very, they much cost a lot less than injection molding. And the other nice thing about vinyl, um, besides the cost, is it has a beautiful texture and usually no seams, but there are great design limitations. So there's a lot you can and can't do. This is a toy by Tara McPherson. Um, and again, back to sort of what makes our toys great. This is one of our best selling older toys. It's called, um, when I was working with Kid Robot, it's called the Smork and Lab. It's designed by an artist named Frank Kozik, who now runs Kid Robot after I sold the company. Um, and if you look at it, you know, obviously a bunny rabbit with a cigarette is kind of a funny thing. But what really made this toy sell was that it has a butthole, <laughs> which was sort of unexpected. And this is, again, this is the bondage version we did for the opening of a nightclub I designed in Toronto. And again, it came with a butthole. And it's these sort of small details that just would make people laugh. These are toys we made with Louis Vuitton, Prada, Hermes. That's Karl Lagerfeld on the right side. And, and, uh, and ended up opening stores around the world. So Kid Robot, when I was still running it, had stores in London and New York City and Miami and Los Angeles. We had stores in Tokyo um, and partners in Seoul, Korea and other places. And a lot of the... the, the the stores are very unique places. For example, in this store, all the mannequins were dead. That was the theory. So as opposed to having the mannequins standing up wearing the clothing, they were all usually lying down or hanging upside down by a news, things like that. Anyway, in 2009, oh, and I should mention that I sold Kid Robot in 2012. I was just burnt out. I'd been working really hard on it for 10 years and um, felt like I'd done all I could do with that. And wanted to move on and so I ended up selling the company and I haven't worked at it since 2012 although the company is still around it's been sold several times and does I think really different things now anyway in 2009 um, this uh, this isn't my bicycle but it looks a lot like it this is the type of bicycle I was riding around New York City back then no one rode bicycles in New York City it seems crazy now because there are so many bike lanes but back then riding a bike was considered a crazy thing to do and I was started building my own bicycles um, and on this, and so essentially what I did is I hired bicycle frame makers to make frames for me and I would build up my bike. I would ride around for a while and people would see me on my bike and they would ask to buy my bike from me. So I would end up selling bikes to friends, sometimes celebrities. Um, and so what I did is I actually took pictures of my bike and created a, a website and just wrote sold out on the bottom. And I had no idea how to make bicycles and it got picked up and within a few days uh, we had about six months worth of orders and then a year's worth of orders and we had to figure out how to make bikes and so I ended up creating Budnitz bicycles. Um, we made very high-end titanium bikes. The idea was to make beautiful high-end bicycles that were made for city riding as opposed to making high-end bicycles that are made for sport. They're more comfortable but they're fast and, cu and customized and mostly made out of titanium. Um, the bikes started at about $6,000 and would go up to about $15,000. We did eventually make some lower end models. This company also just closed um, only a month ago. Thanks to COVID, we just simply couldn't get our supplies from our suppliers. Um, small companies are often the bottom of the food chain and the parts, the bicycle parts, because there's such a boom in bikes were being bought up by giant bike makers like Giant and Specialized and we were unable to get our parts. So. We lost several employees and just decided that maybe it was time after 10 years to shut the company. So sadly, this company no longer exists, but the bicycles are out there and people love them. And we used belt drives instead of chains uh, because they were they were clean, sort of like what you'd see on a motorcycle. It was pretty innovative and we did quite well with it. 2013, some friends and I were talking about how much we hated Facebook and the data exploitation that was happening there and also how lousy our artwork worked there. And we also couldn't figure out why if we were creating art and putting it on the internet, some other company could run ads next to our artwork and make money off of it. That didn't seem fair to us. So we created this company called Ello, um, is a social network. Again, it ha I, I wrote a manifesto for it. This is what it was. And it basically talks about how you are the product that's being bought and sold on a social network and that your art is being, being bought and sold. I put this up on a web page 
and the our Ello was being um, hosted on a server in someone's closet, basically. And um, we blew up, and three weeks later, we had five million people on the network, and we were being interviewed everywhere on BBC, and I was interviewed in India and all kinds of interesting places. And it was really a lot of fun. And it was a massive disaster because we really didn't know what we were doing. And um, we had millions of people trying to join a network that essentially didn't work. And uh, this is how LO eventually ended up. And it was quite beautiful. The company was again sold um, uh, several years ago. So it was just turned out to be a beautiful place with no ads, no data mining a place for people to just post really beautiful stuff. So today, this is what I'm working on, Super Plastic. We founded this company a little less than three years ago, two and a half, three years ago. Um, and the idea behind Super Plastic came a little bit from the work I'd done with Kid Robot and the film work I've done and my love of comic books and my love of um, cartoons and anime and all those things. And the idea was, well, back when we had Kid Robot, giant studios in Hollywood would pay us a lot of money for the rights to make cartoons out of our characters, all the characters we designed making toys because we were just making characters all day long. And usually those cartoons were never made. The shows were never made. Some, a few were, but mostly they weren't. And we would earn a lot of money for things not to be made because Hollywood is really fucking stupid and run terribly, mostly by very spoiled entitled people who don't know what the hell they're doing. And the business model is quite old. So the idea was, well, what if we made characters, animated characters, and gave them lives instead on social media? We could make them famous on our own. And once they were famous, we could then do all kinds of like really crazy stuff with them. And so I went out and raised a little bit of money from some friends um, for this kind of insane idea. And this never happens to me. It's actually worked. It's worked so well that we just did another round of investment. Our investors include Google and Craft Ventures and Founders Fund and all kinds of great Silicon Valley investors. And we have investors like Justin Timberlake and Jared Leto um, and celebrities that are helping us out. And essentially what we're doing is we're making these awesome animated celebrities. This is Googiemon, by the way. He was modeled in some ways um, off a very twisted version of David Bowie. Um, he's very fashionable, but he's obsessed by horror movies, and he's an artist. Um, this is Janky. He's uh, modeled, again, maybe off some of my early heroes from the Beastie Boys. He's kind of a bit of an idiot and a genius at the same time. He only wants to be famous, and he is, he's a, a part-time stuntman and mostly gets hurt on the side for his job. Um, Janky has a lot of problems. And uh, again, the characters, um, you can find them on Instagram, on TikTok. We've grown um, over 6 million followers in the last year since we launched them a little, a little more than a year ago. Um, I think uh, Christmas a year ago. Um, and since then, we've grown about 6 million followers. They have a really fervent following. Um, we do animation with them. I, uh, I'm playing an animation now. I realize it usually comes through terribly on Zoom. Um, the stuff's kind of edgy. There's usually really great music, which you can't hear because it doesn't work at all through Zoom. And this was one of our commentaries on Amazon <laughs> and, uh, um, and the pandemic and the shutdown. Again, Janky's always getting into trouble. He gets killed constantly, usually in, uh, by Googiemon. Um, they're very fashionable. They wear real fashion. They wear Balenciaga. They wear Comedy Garçon. They wear Gucci. Um, again, Googiemon again. I hope these animations are coming through. This is a mu much more recent animation starring these new little characters called Little Helpers. They're these little guys who, um, um, well, they do kind of insane stuff. <laughs> They're here to help, but they mostly cause trouble and blow things up and things like that. And uh, we're working on a separate show for them. Um, more recently, we launched Daisy and Stacks. Um, Daisy is the blue one. And Stacks, um, Daisy and Stacks work in a Chinese restaurant uh, in New York City for minimum wage. They're always broke. They have no money. But to make ends meet, they work also on the side for a little app that allows them to kill zombies. So they kill celebrity zombies. I think they've already killed the Jeremy. Um, God, they've killed a dozen zombies by now, mostly um, incredibly famous people. But zombie versions that are out to kill celebrities, essentially. So they run around and do that. And... Um, this is, they were, did some work with Rico Nasty, a sort of well-known 
if you haven't heard of her, she's great. She's kind of a punk hip hop star. They're, they kind of hang out with celebrities, do all kinds of crazy stuff. They did a, a launch for Gucci recently and we're doing more work with Gucci later this year. And recently now we've just got a film deal. So we're making a movie uh, with our characters and a streaming show as well. So unbelievably, um, we've, we've had all these, we've had, we've had um, really like, I guess you'd say traditional media funded but my insistence is to continue to control the characters. So we did some really interesting things and basically said no to a bunch of large studios that wanted again to work with us. And I just basically said no and everything's independently financed because I don't like large stu studios full of like really stupid people telling us what to do. So you can see one of the ways, again, we monetize our company is through um, toys. So we're selling toy versions of our characters. These are janky toys. Um, we're selling millions of dollars worth a year, but mostly we're selling toys that we love to fans that love them. I care a hell of a lot more about making awesome stuff than making a hell of a lot of money out of them at this point in my career. I just want to make really great things. So we're making limited edition toys based on the characters. Um, fans buy them we, and they resell them on eBay for lots of money, some of them, and but we hope most of them just keep them because they're just so gorgeous, a lot of them. And again, they, they combine that same sort of twisted adult feeling. This is one that was customized by Macbeth, a really well-known um, French uh, street artist, um, Ricardo Calvalo from Spain. Um, this one, uh, Mark Melling from Germany. I think this is really appropriate for how really screwed up the United States is right now, but we don't shy away from political commentary as well. These are cranky toys, actually. Um, um, and it's and there's a new character coming that's related to this and this sort of janky with a spray paint head based on the famous Krylon can. Boogeyman, uh, this, this is by um, Pete Fowler, well-known British designer, did this character for us. And all these characters are appearing in our animation and we even did some toys for gorillas just because uh, we love them so much. And I'm the only one, I think, that's ever made gorillas toys ever because I think I'm the only one that Jamie Hewlett actually trusts to do a good job. So we, we're doing gorillas toys more for fun than anything else. We're also selling apparel. Our apparel is now available in end clothing. It's working its way into the larger retailers. And again, limited edition, we'll make 100 pieces and then sell it out. I'm more interested in making just small runs of great stuff than hitting the masses. It's better marketing, but it's also just way more fun and you can make edgier stuff. Again, more apparel with our characters. And uh, I just have a few more slides. Some people ask me, uh, constantly ask me really like how I do so much stuff. And I basically say it's because I approach things like an idiot. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm not an expert in almost anything. I just find things that I fall in love with and I work really hard. And I love this quote from Suzuki Roshi. He was a Zen, um, a Zen Buddhist monk who more or less brought Zen Buddhism to the United States um, in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. I have a tendency not to hire experts. Um, most of my company is made up of really brilliant people who also don't know what they're doing and we make it up from scratch our own way. Um, and one of the things I like to say to people is that if you think there's a secret that some expert knows, and if you only knew that you could do the career you really want to do, um, the, you're wrong. Those people tend not to do anything new or innovative because they're already experts. They already know what they're doing. Anyway, check out all these addresses on Instagram. You can check out Janky on TikTok as well. Um, and uh, I think that's the end of my talk. And I'm really happy now to take uh, to take questions and anything else. So thank you very much. And I hope that was understandable. It's very weird doing this on Zoom because I can't see anyone. So I have no idea who's here. <laughs> Hi, Paul, definitely. Just a minute, I'll switch my video on. Oh, it was amazing. Um, it was a visual treat and uh, the journey that you led us through was also amazing. And uh, you put in a lot of years and a lot of different ventures uh, so subtly. It sounded like it was nothing, but I'm quite, a, I mean, it's, it must have been quite a journey, you know, from street uh, art to retail design, to uh, fashion, to bicycles, to God knows what. And I'm sure if I'm so amazed, I'm sure the students would be, you know, really thinking, how can we become even 
some part of it. Anyway, it was really, really inspiring. I will just Thank see you. there are one or two questions and um, let me put them out to you. And was it was that understandable, Taruna? I can't. Uh, did you did it come through OK? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you. It's hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I was just thinking because we've also been teaching. So I was just thinking you talking to a screen and it comes it came across so well and confident. I was a little envious in between. Yeah. So yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a question. Could you share how you and Hagi came up with the designs of the Janky series? And also, is it yeah. possible if we can get the Janky series three in India too? Please um, uh, excuse my error with pronunciation. I'm not it's okay. to all of this, yeah. but uh, I'm sure the yeah. Hug, minds are. It's fine, yes, thank you, it's perfect and sounds great. The, um, yeah, the Janky series of toys was designed by Huck and myself, um, although I really have to like really credit Huck's talent, Huck, Hucky, he's, um, he's, he and I have been working together on and off since my first, since Kid Robot, so almost 20 years. And um, that series of toys is available on our website and we do ship to India. I don't think we have a retailer there direct now. We only, I think we only have 15 places that sell our toys that aren't ourselves. We mostly do everything ourselves because I'm a control freak. And I want to make sure that <laughs> that everything we do looks and feels great. So you can go to our website, but we're very happy to ship to India. I think it's expensive. Um, I apologize for that, for the how much the shipping probably is. But um, hopefully someday we will have a great outlet somewhere in India. I just don't. I just. I don't think we do yet. Okay, we'll be hoping that day comes soon, and I'm sure. Meanwhile, they can probably get it shipped. Um, sure. Also, we were just having this discussion. We today was an interesting day. We started with the, the session with someone from uh, California, and then we moved on. Mm -hmm. And there were many uh, speakers who brought in various perspective on toys. And it's interesting to kind of it looks like it's come a full circle again now with uh, you in New York, I believe. Yeah. And um, yeah. Uh, and and we also there was a, a someone who showed us through toys which are happening in um, in Banaras and all of that. Um, it's just a question from my end, you know. Do you think at some point something which is India inspired can also something that you've done which was India inspired or something like that? If you would like to share or talk about it, uh, I think we'll be able to relate. Yeah. yeah. Actually, this is interesting. I mean, this is inspired. I'm going to open up a web page if I can find it while I'm talking. But um, this is a toy we did with Kid Robot. Um, oh no, I can't find it. I apologize. But we did. We we did a version of um, of, a, of a of a work of art by Doz Green that was inspired by Ganesha. Okay. Um, by by a Ganesha idol, and it was just quite. I think both respectful and quite beautiful. You know, but the materials were vinyl, and the feeling of it was very modern. And so I think that there's we're influenced by art all around the world, and um, I think there's just I don't know we it it comes from all all over the place. I would say and thank you. Yes, I and I by the way I I think that it, the way the world is right now, I I think internationally art and ideas from India are both stylish, both stylish right now, which is a good thing. Um, and I think there's just a lot of interest because I feel like the, the, the West where we are uh, feels like it's repeating itself. It feels a little bit dead a lot of the time. And so any new influences I, I think are really welcomed and I think embraced, so. There's another question. Um, where do you get the inspiration of the characters of your toys? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, well, it's a combination, I think, from there's a thing we used to talk about with about called appropriation. So if you take something from, let's say, popular culture and you just copy it, that's stealing. And it tends to not be very interesting. But appropriation is when you take something 
that was created and that's in the that's in the wider culture, let's say um, the Simpsons, right? And you appropriate some of their aesthetic and you cross it with you know something from a horror movie and what you end up with is cause who's a very well-known toy and graffiti artist right so it, the appropriation of pop culture fine art traditional culture craft um things you see on tv for us a lot of it and for me a lot of it has to come comes from fashion music things like that and and we're just we'll be inspired by all that style and then mix it all together Wonderful. You've been also speaking a lot about material I've uh, followed through and, you know, um, and because a lot of students are, you know, a lo lot of the audience are students and uh, uh, so, yeah. you know, how do you decide material and what has to be taken and whatnot, and also with the super plastic, et cetera, you know, what really made you decide that this was the material and from the, you know, I, I would like the answer to be, from the perspective of, you know, how the students can take something from there. Right, yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because I feel like there are some people that come out in the world and, um, excuse the noise, I think it will end soon. There's some people that um, come out in the world and they totally know what they're doing already. They, um, you know, they, maybe they're going to be a famous violinist you know, and they have a talent, maybe they're going to be a doctor and they know it and this is what they want to do. i never knew really what I wanted to do, really. And I still feel that way. And I think the inspiration comes a lot of the time from you just see something. And for me, as I get older, I think less. I find that our minds, our thinking mind, the mind that is often comparing and analytical, the mind that I think is nurtured often in school, when we take math and science classes, um, and that helps us pass exams is completely useless for creativity. And over, and it can be good. I mean, that part of ourselves is good because it helps us evaluate and answer maybe the question you asked, what should I do? I have 10 ideas, which of these ideas is good? But none of those ideas, the good ones and the bad ones came from thinking about it. They came from inside our bodies. I often feel like they come from our heart. And so for me, you know, I've always just been excited about the idea of making animation. It's something I just want to do. And so as I walked around, suddenly it just hit me that this was a great idea and it just sort of arises in you. And then the next question is, is this an absolutely stupid idea? And can I actually do it? Is it possible to do? Um, so I can't tell you exactly where the ideas come from, but I can say that it is worthwhile generally to make, generally to do a little bit of an experiment and see if your idea is so stupid that it just will never work, or if it's just on the edge of stupid enough that it's brilliant, you know? And to find that line is really, it, that's, that can be difficult. But I think if you're excited by something and you go ahead with confidence and you believe that making it is possible and then you're relentless, you really can do amazing things, but you also have to be willing to be really relentless in your work. I'm an incredibly hard worker. I just, and, and I enjoy work. So it's not a problem. I enjoy it. I don't, I don't find working to be a problem. And I think if you put those things together, it can be good. I think if you, uh, I think that um, playing it safe and taking no risks is, can be a great way to not have a career that's very interesting or a life that's very interesting. You can take risks that are stupid because um, they're sim you're simply trying to do something. Like if I tried to be a hip hop star, it would be awful even though I'd love to do it, honestly. It would be a terrible idea because I simply have no talent. But I think that it, I think that in the end, on the other hand, I think that most of the things I've done, including super plastic, just sounded like really dumb ideas when I started at them out. I mean, I'm going to make cartoon characters, give them lives on Instagram. They'll become famous. We'll sell millions of dollars worth of stuff and then we'll get to make movies and TV shows, you know? And we'll do this all independently and we'll control it ourselves and we won't let anyone tell us what to do. It's an awful, awful plan, but it's working, I think, partially out of just a willingness to, to push forward and the excitement to do it and the belief that we can do it our own way because every, the rest of the industry is so dead. And that's where I saw the opportunity. It's amazing how you've been using me. a lot of opposites <laughs> all in one sentence. 
and uh, yes. I think that that's the order in chaos. It's amazing. Uh, so a lot of questions are coming. Yeah. This, the, there's a lot of interest that's generated. So a, a quick question first: Do you still make films? <laughs> well, I'm making. We are making films with this company. So uh, the answer is no. I haven't made films. We made short films for the bicycle company, and we're making long films and, and animations for Super Plastic um, with a team. But the answer is no, not by myself. I photograph just for fun for myself, but I don't make films anymore. I, would, I mean, yes and no. Yes, I do, but they're animated, so. <laughs> Another question, can can see a lot of bunny inspired characters. Any reason for that? So all questions from the audience, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, my daughter has a pet bunny named Iffy. And so they're inspired partially because we have a pet bunny rabbit here. <laughs> but the thing is about, the thing about rabbits is, and this is the same for most animals, is that um, some animals just have different, they're iconic. And so if you're using, whether it's a rabbit or a fox or a dog or a cat or an animal, you don't know what it is. You have you ask yourself if the animal is one that's more aggressive traditionally, we'll usually dress them in flowery, very cute clothing. If it's an animal like a, a bunny rabbit, we'll usually make them darker and more twisted and it creates depth for the character. Another question almost on similar lines to what was asked earlier. I'm just repeating it so that hopefully you'll come to India and do something with inspired from India. So the question goes, um, some of your characters uh, in Indian version are going to be crazy. So are you thinking of planning the style of India? Maybe we need a proposal from somebody who's inspired or maybe one of you need to do it. But maybe, you know, I, one of the reasons I'm on this call when I was invited, as I said, that my one of my life ambitions is uh, my life ambitions is to come to India. I simply haven't had time, but I would like to come and I'd like to spend a long time there, wandering around um, and and learning from people. So perhaps at some point someone can make us a proposal. We would definitely consider it. It would be very very exciting to me. So I think it'd be great. So we yeah. we we do you know, invite you, the... and we'll thank send you a proposal. Thank you. Very soon, we'll be excited. Yeah, to I, mean, I, I think I, in, in some ways, I would say that Indian philosophy, both design and, and actually as maybe one of the spiritual homes of the world, you would say, right, has affected the West in ways that I think a lot of people in India don't quite realize, sometimes in subtle ways. And I can say in my own work, you can hear me when you mentioned it when I talk, I consider that one of my greatest strengths is my willingness to own all my weaknesses, right? And so if I say, um, you know, I know for a fact that I can be very impulsive um, in making decisions, right? Because I know that about myself and I, I can fight that and say, Paul, you're, such, you're so impulsive and you move ahead with things too fast and often causes great disasters at my company when I have an idea and we just move too fast. I could blame myself for it, but instead what I tend to do is I admit that this is true about myself. And once you own that thing, and, and I would say in a lot of ways, once you understand and own that thing about yourself and say that this is something I'm not good at, it no longer becomes a threat. And in fact, I don't have to be impulsive anymore now that I know how impulsive I am. And in a lot of ways, I, I, I encourage the people I work with to use their weaknesses as strengths by understanding them and then making either asking for help, which is something we can do. I can be very disorganized. So I hired someone very organized to help me run the company because I know I'm able to admit I'm like really disorganized. I even, we even missed the call yesterday because I wasn't the one who was disorganized, but someone else was. <laughs> but I would say that, that that theme, it keeps you humble and it really pushes, it, it really allows you to not be afraid to move forward. And I, and, I, and I would say that, I don't know how else to say this, but I, I think there's a lot of the influence, there's a lot of influence around a more holistic view of ourselves and our life that I think India has brought to the West and has brought to art and has brought to business. And I think that that, I don't know how, if that is so recognized. So anyway. 
That's amazing. Sometimes it is, sometimes we just take it for granted. It's there as part of our culture and we don't recognize it uh, as consciously as maybe sometimes we should. Um, yeah. And in fact, you sort of answered uh, another part of the question that was coming to my mind, which is, you know, how do you take mm -hmm. failures? But you kind of answered that. But I'll just add a little thing to that and um, something that I wanted to know. You've done a lot of businesses and you've given them up or they got sold or something. And uh, when you do that, so there are, two, there are two paths to that journey. You're starting something and it's like, you know, almost uh, like giving birth again. And when, is, yeah. and when it goes or when you're selling it out or something, it's almost like parting from something that you uh, created. And so while it, yeah. you just said that you did this and you sold this, uh, could you just share how did you emotionally deal with this whole thing? Was it easy? Was it tough or whatever? What, what did you just go through? Because it was a lot of... Uh, yeah. It was awful, actually. <laughs> Like, so if, when you build a company and you fall in love with that company right. and the people that are there, um, or, you know, whether or not it's a, uh, several companies I've created, I've sold sometimes because I felt like I needed to move on and I wasn't good for the company anymore. Sometimes mostly because of that. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the bicycle company after 10 years, of, it did a great job and it just couldn't keep going thanks to the pandemic and some other things, but I, it always hurts. And I don't, I don't think one thing I should say when I talk about weakness or maybe the suffering that comes from when you have to give something up, it's not that we say we're, we have weaknesses and so that's good or that I have to give up this company and it doesn't hurt. Everything's okay. It's that it actually hurts. It, it's in when I gave kid robot, it took me several years just to kind of get over it like a breakup, you know? And that, I think that's constantly true. And it's the same thing. I, you know, the weaknesses we have, they're not things that we say, oh, that's so great. But at the same time, we don't have to make a problem out of a problem. In the same way we don't, we can grieve in the same way when I left companies now, or when I pass on to another thing, I grieve the same way someone, you grieve when somebody dies. And then you get over it. And then there's some, but fortunately for me, there's always something else I'm really excited to do. I need to see what the next adventure is. And sometimes I don't know what it is. And so that is, that can be sustaining, but it doesn't mean it's not hard. Thank you, uh, Paul. I think um, what you've shared within this uh, short span of uh, maybe 40 minutes uh, is amazing. Not just your work, uh, you've also given insights to your thought processes and you know answered a lot of questions and uh, I'm sure it was very inspiring for everybody to hear. Uh, yes, the professional style, side of the entire thing, but also the human side and you know, the, you also broaden philosophy inside and uh, you really shared everything out so openly. So a uh, huge thanks for that. Um, mm. And okay. as I said, we will welcome and invite you soon. We hope that a lot of people can meet you and you can meet uh, as in India uh, very soon. So thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, and thank uh, you. on behalf I'm of- I'm so grateful to get to do this. Sorry? Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a lot of gratitude for getting to be here and I hope that someday I'll get to come in person. It would be a great wish fulfilled for me to meet you. So thank you. <laughs>